I recognize that I only know what I know and that there are other people who know far more than what I know. And I listen to smart people when they give me advice. Welcome to At the Heart of It. Welcome to At the Heart of It. I'm Nancy Brown, Chief Executive Officer of the American Heart Association. Inspiration comes in many shapes and forms, but authenticity and sincerity are what make it truly powerful. My guest today embodies it all and has a contagious enthusiasm that will brighten your day and possibly change your life in more ways than one. He's a reminder to us all that you can reinvent your life. I am so excited for you to meet media personality, motivational speaker, and financial management genius, Malcolm J. Harris, also known as MJ. Encouraging and inspiring the masses, one video at a time. Meet Malcolm MJ Harris. MJ is an internationally recognized CEO, executive producer, and social media influencer. Growing up with entrepreneurial-minded parents, MJ was destined to succeed. He is the CEO and founder of the National Care and OmniBay family of companies, one of America's largest African-American-owned financial services teams. MJ has been featured on Oprah on the Life You Want Tour, Market Watch, USA Today, Ebony Magazine, and more. He was also the host of Smart Money on KTLA in Los Angeles. MJ shares financial and wealth secrets through his Omnimedia platform, offering online courses and instructional videos. When he's not empowering fans to make better financial decisions, MJ is inspiring millions on social media. So buckle up and get ready because Malcolm MJ Harris is sure to inspire all of us never to back down from our dreams. MJ, welcome. Thank you so much. You know what, Nancy? I'm going to have you wake me up every morning and, and list out all those things. That just boosted my self-esteem just hearing it. I love it. I love it. MJ, I'm so happy to have you, and I know you like to have fun. So I've got some quick questions to start us off. It's called My Signature Five. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. What's the last TV show you watched or streamed? Squid Wars. Squid Games. Squid Wars, Squid Games. Whatever the name of that is, it's really popular now. I binge watched it. Oh, binge watch. I love binge watching. What's the last great meal you had? Um, dinner last night. I had, um, I had, it was this garlic shrimp with the tomato sauce over some spinach. Mm. I'm trying to cut my carbs. You are making me hungry. That sounds so good. <laughs> What's the last song you listened to? Can We Talk by Tevin Campbell. Oh. Wonderful. What was your first job? Working in my, um, my parents had a hair salon and I used to answer the phones there. I was not very good at it. I was just there to listen to the gossip, but that was my job. Yeah. You, so three people showed up at the same time for their appointment, but at least you All knew what time. was going on in town, huh? Mm -hmm. I knew what was going on with everybody's husband. I love it. That's good. <laughs> what is your superpower? I am very intuitive, but I, above all, I'm very resilient. I can get up from anything. I can reinvent myself. I am I'm those things. I listen to the voice within me to tell me what my next step is, and then I'm willing to do whatever I have to do in order to accomplish that. I resilience. love it. We're going to learn a little bit more about that today. But just as background, so for our guests, you are an internationally recognized CEO, executive producer, lifestyle and business influencer who has been featured by Oprah. And now you're producing digital content. Tell us about that journey. How did that happen? You know, honestly, it came out of nowhere. My dream for my life was just to be able to open a small insurance agency in the suburbs of the D.C. metro area. And that was that. But, you know, life had a different path for me. And I will say this. One of the things that I do best is I listen to smart people when they tell me ideas. And what happened with me over the years was I just came in contact with some really smart people 
who would tell me from time to time, have you considered trying this? Or you have a gift in this, have you considered that? And I just took the risk. So rather it was doing my first YouTube video, which got me into the video space, or rather it was, hey, no one else is coming at you with the kind of content you want. Why don't you make yourself into a producer and create it for yourself? I recognize that I only know what I know and that there are other people who know far more than what I know. And I listen to smart people when they give me advice. That is magical. And now fast forward to today, you have a global reach of over 20 million people each month across social media and TV. That's incredible. What is your secret sauce that draws people to you? And when did you realize that this content was impacting people's lives? Well, you know, I think the secret sauce is that I am myself. Um, you know, I have many different types of content out there um, from doing 8,000 videos over the last 13 or wow. so years. And so I just am myself, whatever that means in that moment in time. And I think that love me or not, one thing you can never say is that you did not get an authentic experience. And I think that people are always attracted to things that they feel are real and honest. And that is what I think um, has allowed me to resonate with so many audiences um, for, so, um, for so long, um, really, is the fact that I'm myself. And when did you first realize that your content was impacting people's lives? When I did my first video on YouTube, it was like a comedic, inspirational story, so to speak. And a friend of mine shared it onto his page because he had a pretty big following, a big following at the time. And I got like 10,000 views within a day, which was far more than what I expected. Wow. And I saw in the comments, wow, people, I resonate with people. I impact people in a positive um, way. It was, it was pretty immediately clear to me. And then over time, people would always inbox me and say these nice things to me. And it was my mother. She said, do you actually take in what people are saying about you? And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I see when we're out in the street, people come to you and they say all these great things to you. And you just say, thank you so much. And you take the picture. But do you, does it resonate with you that these people mean what they say? I cognitively knew that I was impacting people positively, but it was that conversation with her that, no, this really does mean something. Um, to people. So it was sort of an iterative process, you know, for me to really own and walk in that, wow, I am an inspirational voice that imp impacts people's lives in a positive way. Yeah. And always listen to mom because mothers know best, you know, so that was that was good advice from your mom. You know, MJ, speaking of inspiration, one of the things I'm so inspired by about you is how your company helps underserved populations achieve their financial goals you even specialize in helping people who live with chronic conditions. So as a money and life coach, how do you define financial and overall wellness? I think that financial wellness is, are you living a life that reflects what you believe is the life that you deserve? And to take that down into more practical terms, if you are financially struggling, do you believe that this is the life that you deserve? If the answer is no, then we need to look at what are some tactical choices we can make within your life in order to change that. From a health perspective, is your current health state something that you believe that you deserve to be dealing with? If the answer is no, then how can we make some choices to make your life more manageable or to make your health, this, your state of health something that is reflective of the life that you desire and deserve um, to live? Yeah, that's such a great framing. And I think that people need to hear that, you know, to to be inspired, to see a future that's different than maybe the future people have today. And one of the things that gets in the way of that sometimes for people is shame. And you've said that overcoming shame is one way for someone to live their best and most authentic life. Tell us more about that. Well, I just think that shame is, 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 is the anchor and the weight that keeps us tied to the life. It keeps us tied to our old self. It keeps us tied to trauma. It keeps us tied to pain. There's no place and no functional positive purpose that shame has in our life. I would even venture to say that fear can have a positive purpose within your life. My fear of getting hit by a bus is going to keep me from walking into the street without looking both ways. So fear can be helpful at times, but shame has never been helpful. It never does anything for you. And I think that in order for you to live your best life, whatever that looks like for you, in order for you to make better financial choices, better healthcare choices, whatever it may be, you got to first be willing to manage and deal with your shame of what you're going through. One of the biggest things I always tell people about overcoming shame is being able, shame and silence are, are cousins. They come together, right? And so what I always say is if one of the things that you may want to look at if you're trying to figure out, well, how do I overcome shame? 
opening yeah. your mouth and talking to people about what you are ashamed of. You don't have to tell, everyone doesn't, doesn't deserve the right to know your story. Everyone doesn't deserve it, but there are people within your world who do deserve to know your story. Opening up about your story, what you're going through, what you've been through, what your fears are, what your concerns are. You'd be surprised how being able just to open your mouth and share your secrets, how that takes away shame's power. Yeah. And it probably also gives the other person permission to open up and talk to you about things they may be going through as well. And so often people feel like they have to hide it. I've never heard it articulated the way that you just did. It's very powerful, very powerful. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that when I open up to you and then you open up to me and vice versa, we have now actually built up, made our relationship that much stronger in that moment. It's so true. And, you know, just the other day, I had a very prominent um, physician say something to me that I was stunned by. But, you know, it opened up this wonderful dialogue. He said to me, you know, I deserve to be happier than I am right now. And I'm going to do something about it. And he began to talk to me about the things that were standing in the way, including his physical location far away from his family and other kinds of things. And it just, it, it what you're saying right now just reminds me, and it will remind our viewers that two-way conversation helps both people. We should never feel like we're burdening people by telling them about our shame or what's going on in our life because chances are it's going to open up a door for them to disclose as well. I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more. So MJ, how would you describe your career pivot and what advice would you give to the millions of people who are trying to figure out what is their next move? You know, it was so funny. I heard Whoopi Goldberg say one time, They'd ask, like, how did she, uh, how has she been able to last so long in the industry? I think she's maybe getting a Lifetime Achievement Award. There was something happening where people were reflecting back on her career. And she said, I always say yes. And that has been my stance. You know, at the end of the day, I don't think that rigidity around your life path is going to get you anywhere. You have to be willing to be open to say, what is life showing me right now about what I should be doing. You know, I've tried this. I've tried looking under this cover and this cover and this cover, and there's nothing under there. Is there one that you haven't looked under or one that's been more fruitful? And for me, that's what my pivots, because it's been multiple ones throughout my career. Um, what has come from is I'm in a space and I'm looking around me and saying, okay, this ain't working, but that is working. What do I need to do to go over there and get to that? And I just consistently, I, I'm, I'm not very good at the whole things where people say, what's your 10 year plan? I've never been very good at that. I'm looking in this moment, what is the next best decision that I can make? Because my logic is if I can keep on making the next best decision, then that'll allow me to pivot when needed and stay the course when needed as well. And how does that tie to your intuition? You talked earlier about, you know, living by what you what you feel. This is a great example of that, I think, right? I think at the end of the day, we all have an internal compass. Rather you call that internal compass just your own common sense and inner will. We all got it. And I think that if we all reflect back, we can identify very clear moments in our life where we, when we did not listen to um, that inner voice, we had consequences that we experienced. And so for me, my intuition how it plays in, just to keep it as simple as possible, because everyone can do this, is I just listen to that voice within me. And if I ever find that I'm having trouble listening to that voice within me, then it is time to get silent so that I can hear that voice. And by silent, meaning get off the phone, get off the computer or whatever device I'm on. And it could just be go sitting in, in the yard or going for a drive. I live not too far from the ocean. And so going there, but whatever that may be, um, I give myself the space and the silence to hear whatever that voice is. And it's especially critical that I do that within moments where I feel like I've got big decisions to make. Yeah, I love that advice. That will really help so many people. And I think it also helps people who feel that others have decided a path for their career and their future for them. I see that so much. You know, people live their lives, all of us, I think. We want to be accepted. We want people to think we're doing the logical thing that people expect us to do. And that isn't always what we want to do, right? So so tell us a little about that. You must encounter people like that uh, that come to you for advice. So for me, I had to have some very critical moments within my life where I had to say, you know what? Living authentically as myself means I'm going to have to disappoint some people. And I'm going to have to be okay with that. And I also have to accept for myself that if the only way that you can love me, that you can support me, that you can have my back is if I do what you think I should do, then this is not a relationship of any kind. This is a prison at that point. And so I had to be willing to disappoint people, trusting within myself that if I had to 
move away from somebody or they ended up moving away from me because I made an alternative choice from what they thought I should be doing. And it often doesn't result that way. Most of the time, it's, our minds think that it's going to be much more catastrophic than what it will be if we disappoint someone by, by doing our own thing. But worst case scenario, if that were to happen, that someone detaches from me and says, I don't want to deal with you anymore because you're not choosing the life path that I thought. What I have to trust is that there are more than enough people in this world who are looking for a relationship with somebody just like me, and they will fill that space eventually. You've got it. That is so powerful. So MJ, you have accomplished so much, really like so much. I can't wait to see what's ahead, but let's look back and tell us what you're most proud of. What, you know, when you think of all you have done in your life, what makes you feel great? Um, parenting at this, at this point in my life. That is probably the thing that makes me proudest every single day. You know, you become kind of, and I'm working on this, you become very numb at times to when it's um, career high point after career high point. I have low points too, you know, but when you have these things that consistently keep on, on happening, you can kind of numb it a bit because you're always looking towards what's the next thing, what's the next thing. And you pay these people around you to always keep you planning for the next you Got thing. it. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. Got to keep it going. And but I will say that the thing that is most centering to me that gives me the most happiness and the most pride is being able to parent. That is what makes me the happiest. I will say beyond that, um, those moments where, you know, I have a very large audience, but I largely I live in kind of a bubble. I'm only around the people that I see even pre COVID, you know, when we were fil when we were filming normally, I was only around the people that work with me. So when I'm out and about and people come up to the table or come up to wherever I'm at and say positive, nice things or how I impacted them in some positive, nice way, those make me really, really proud in those moments because you're not telling me that my candle made your house smell fabulous <laughs> or that my whatever, like this product, what you're telling me is how I had a positive impact on your experience. So impacting people's lives, you know, is what makes me, I, I would say, probably most proud. Love that. So how does the helper get help? Who do you turn to when you've had a bad day? And what is the best advice you have received in your life? And who did it come from? At this stage of my life, I have dedicated the better part of the last decade to the world around me. And because I was so focused on being a service to the world around me, I never really focused on the parts of myself that were that needed support at times. I kind of just would numb that. But there's a strange thing that happens. People think that their, their problems all get solved once they get money or get whatever it may be. But I don't think that. I think that your problems amplify because once you get the money, now you're not working towards or worrying about money anymore. So you've now got that much more emotional and mental bandwidth to now have to deal with the stuff that you were ignoring while you were getting the money. That is definitely something that is a big focal point for me. I actually was just speaking with a friend about that around things that I can do for my own self-care. So I will say, because I know we're going to come back together again at some point in time, I'm going to have an update for you around the things that I'm doing for my own self-care. I am going to hold you accountable to that um, because I think we all want to know. I was going to say one of the most centering things for me um, at this stage of my life is as, as mindless as it may seem, I enjoy watching good documentaries and good TV, things that allow me to take my mind off of all the other stuff, the emails, the everything that goes on in your life as an executive, things like that. And so that's one of my favorite activities is sitting in the evening with Marco and we will watch um, watch television together because it's my time with him and it's also that. So if I could give any advice to someone, at least from what I've learned so far, finding a centering activity that you enjoy, however mindless it may seem, just something that can take your mind away from all the stuff happening in your world. And make it a priority to do that, it sounds like. I'd like to switch to something a little more serious and start by saying thank you about how outspoken you have been about being vaccinated against COVID-19. Why was it so important for you to spread the message and how can we help others understand the critical need for vaccination? You know, from the moment that COVID, you know, hit, I was kicking off a tour and I was and they told me I need to fly back home. And as I was flying back home, I'm reading all these articles. I'm sitting on a plane and I didn't know what was going to happen. None of us really knew what was happening at that point in time. But what became clear to me instantly was I started reading historical things about pandemics. And I said, we need a vaccination. I knew that early on. We need a vaccination. This is not unprecedented what we've dealt with. And these things, if smallpox, all the flu, Spanish flu it was, 
all this got resolved with vaccinations. And so for me, I just kind of remember for myself, there's nothing new under the sun. Vaccinations are not new. They are probably one of the oldest types of medical interventions out there. And they have also proven to be one of the safest um, types of medical interventions out there. And so I became outspoken about vaccinations because I think oftentimes we have a short memory or we're just not aware of the clear reference points in history that we've been through this before. And so I became outspoken about it because I want to normalize it. When you have a platform of people who are willing to listen to you, you also have a responsibility to give them information that you know to be true as helpful information. And they can take with it and do what they choose with it. And so my logic was, although I knew that I could be amongst the many other you know, famous people who speak about vaccines and get a backlash, I was okay with that. Because at the end of the day, you not liking my stance or you unfollowing me because of the vaccine stuff. Well, frankly, I don't like the fact that you unvaccinated and that you could be potentially helping to continue a pandemic that's help, that's affecting the world. So I, we got two things we don't like, but I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm all right with you not liking me for this one. Um, that was one of the pieces. And I think the other piece was just that I knew that if we were outspoken about the vaccination, that even if people weren't going to do it or they thought they weren't going to do it, it would at least challenge them to have the conversation with themselves about why they weren't going to do it, because I was right in their face doing it. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much. Your messaging has been powerful for sure. Your messaging about your own health has been powerful as well. You're in your 30s, you're so health conscious, but you recently posted about a health scare, stress, high blood pressure that led you to become more intentional about self-care. What happened? It was early in the pandemic. I had gotten a beach house because I was like, if I'm going to be stuck in the house, I got to see something pretty every day. And I had just been in there for maybe a week or two, a week or two. And um, I just, my heart was racing. I, I didn't, I wasn't feeling great. And so I called someone to the house to, um, to do an exam. Um, and when I did that, that's when I found out uh, about my blood pressure being elevated. And what was clear to me was that all of us have stressors in our life. And, you know, unless you're perfect about your eating and your exercise habits, I'm sure we could all afford to do a little bit better. And so what was clear to me was that all this work that I'm doing to build businesses, all this stuff, that stuff doesn't matter if I'm not alive to enjoy it or not healthy enough to enjoy it. It doesn't matter if you have a closet full of of shoes, if you're not healthy enough to go out anywhere to actually wear them. And so for myself, chose to be very open about that, like I've been about many parts of my life, because I wanted people to check in with themselves. Your heart can be, not to be morbid about this, but, you know, issues of the heart can be a silent killer, you know, that you don't know about them until you need to know about them. And I wanted people to proactively think about what was going on with their own health. Yeah. Well, I am so grateful to you for doing that because I think when people see, my gosh, that this happens to MJ, maybe I need to get my blood pressure checked and worry about the stress in my life. It it has had an amazing difference. So tell us what you do for self-care. What is your favorite form of self-care? So I will say less from a health perspective, what I did was I actually got a chef to do meal prep for me. And, you know, back in the day when I was going up, the idea of having a chef do anything like, oh, you must be really rich. But nowadays you have so many meal prep companies. And with all of us using all these meal delivery services, I actually found out that it was cheaper for me. I cut down my cost on food by about half wow. by doing a meal prep service. And so what he does is on the beginning of the week, Sunday, Monday time frame, he brings all the meals to the house for uh, for the week. And then I have a lot of control over that to say low sodium, so on and so forth um, within that. So that was one of my self-care items was choosing to intentionally put money into good food. And for folks out there who think that they can't afford that, well, you're eating anyway. So add up, legitimately add up how much you're spending on food because after housing and transportation, most people's highest expense is food. So more than likely you've got the resources to make some healthier choices. It's just about redirecting those resources in an intentional way. Uh, one of the other things is I uh, work out. So um, for me, I have no discipline whatsoever around working out. So I do have a trainer um, who helps me. But if that's not, if you don't have the resources to get a trainer, I think a workout partner um, is always a great thing. And if you can't find one partner, then have two or three people that you can work with and say, hey, I'm going today. Who wants to join me? Do a group text. I'm going to work out today at XYZ time. Who wants to join me? It's accountability. And sleep is something I'm very intentional about in terms of my self-care, specifically around my health, is making sure that I sleep. So I put my phone 
This was a big thing for me, Nancy. I put my phone on Do Not Disturb at night. Ooh, good for you. Yeah, because I would get asked the question like, well, what about like if there's an emergency? And I said, you know what? I got a teenager here. If there's an emergency in the house, he will alert me. If there's someone who's not here, I can't afford to be your emergency point of contact. If I'm not taking care of me, I can't be your emergency point of contact. So if I'm the only person that they can call, then you need to do do something for yourself to find some other people to be in your life. Because at this point, I can't keep my phone on at night just for the off chance that somebody may call me with an emergency because that would disturb me from getting the sleep that I needed. Yeah. Well, boy, those are some valuable tips. And I think this idea of putting yourself first, eating healthy, is so fun to eat healthy. And healthy food tastes really good, too. Having accountability with a workout partner, all of those are great pieces of advice. Is there anything about you that would surprise us? Well, this is something that's always surprised me when they're out eating with me. I don't drink uh, any alcohol. Um, I do not um, do any drug of any kind. I know marijuana is not a drug in a lot of the states nowadays, but I don't do that. Um, I am a very, because I have a very out loud over the top um, persona, you know, within my work, but I live a very quiet life. I live in the suburbs, not too far from the ocean. You know, I, my favorite thing is my plants outside, you know, um, I, I live a very, very calm, um, low key um, lifestyle. For myself, I'm actually very introverted, which I think shocks a lot of people as, as well. Being on camera is a great outlet um, for me, but I'm the person where if I'm in the room with you, you could very easily overlook me because I am not. I don't get energized by interacting with a ton of people at all. You know, it kind of it takes my energy. But peace and beauty around you sounds like it gives you a lot of beauty. And you know, in the past, you've said. I use my life as a classroom. Tell us what that means and how do you want us to learn? Well, I use my life as a classroom because I think that everything I go through, good or bad, or, or, or however it feels in that moment, is something that someone else has gone through. And so that's also been one of my keys to amassing such a large audience is I share with people what I'm going through, or at least at that process to some degree to be able to explain it in some in a clear way. And my class, my life is a classroom because the the lessons are coming from my own experiences in a lot of cases. And I I think that it's just very empowering to people because it makes the lesson more relatable. It's not as preachy um, to people, but it also frees me to be able to share. You'd be surprised how many things I've worked through through sharing it with the audience and helping them to work through it. And I'm getting my own next steps around what to do as I'm helping educate them about what I've done so far. So it's a symbiotic relationship that benefits us both. Yeah, lots of energy going back and forth, it sounds like, for sure. So MJ, in closing, what words of wisdom would you like to share with our audience? Well, I would say this, um, what you desire is what you deserve. If you, de if you desire to be healthy mentally, emotionally, financially, that is what you deserve. You know, I, I don't care where you come from. I don't care what the norm of the environment is around you. I don't care how the people live um, who are around you, even if it's your kids or your spouse. At the end of the day, the time kind of like the you des that you desire is what you deserve. But here's the reality. Those desires are going to remain a dream unless you're willing to take the steps. And sometimes they're hard steps in order to accomplish that kind of life. So what I, what the word of advice that I would give to anyone is that the bridge that takes you from where you're at now to where you want to be is going to be boundaries. What boundaries are you willing to place on yourself around what you're willing to put in your body? What boundaries are you willing to place on yourself around the access that you're willing to allow people to have you or how you're going to let people treat you? Because that's a big stressor too. You know, um, what boundaries are you willing to put within your life and within your relationships to ensure, because I believe that boundaries are really the guardrail that protects us from us going off track, but also protects us from distractions coming at us. What boundaries are you willing to put in your life so that you can stay on the path of accomplishing the life that you desire and deserve to live? MJ, that is so powerful. Thank you so much for being with us today. I have learned so much from you and I just uh, will continue to look forward to watching you, applauding you, and you will be back well, with the answer to our question about self-care and, and inspiration. So thank you, MJ. We are so grateful to you. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. I learned so much by listening to MJ 
he said he's learned a lot by listening to smart people. I think we've learned a lot by listening to him. And one of the most profound things that he said is, are you living the life you believe you deserve? And if not, how will you work to make better choices and decisions? And he also talked about boundaries. What boundaries will you put in your life so that you can stay on the path to live the life you deserve? Those are incredibly powerful words and things that we can all live by. I'd also like to know what you took away from our conversation today. Please subscribe, comment, and share. I'm Nancy Brown. Thank you for joining in. On the next At the Heart of It, going backward to move forward. Take um, three to six months to go back and really relearn. See how challenging new ideas may mean going back to the drawing board. Next, At the Heart of It.